If Reality Check Radio enriches your day in life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and the dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Simon Anderson made a name for himself on X, or Twitter as it used to be called, in the wake of the Posey Parker event, where he filmed and helped identify many of the violent men dressed as women who succeeded in shutting the event down. I wanted to hear what makes him tick and what he thinks about the new media landscape and a few other topical issues. Simon is on the line with me now. Simon, welcome to The Crunch and welcome back to RCR. Good afternoon, Cam. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, we're we're back on air. You're the uh, the first person that I've spoken to since we had our little hiatus. I thought thought I'd introduce the audience to someone they might have seen on X or or on Facebook, um, and put a voice to the person behind the camera. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, I will do. Uh, I'm I'm by trade. I work in an esoteric field of technology called enterprise architecture. Uh, but I came to prominence last year for filming demonstrations, in particular the Let Women Speak event where Posey Parker was uh, was assaulted in, in Albert Park. And subsequently to that, I've been getting along and filming those sorts of things and filming interesting events uh, in and around Auckland, kind of trying to create some some sort of hyper local news. Uh, as a bit of a contrast to to what we get from the legacy media, and alongside that, I I do a bit of writing as well, and I I, I write on uh, topics. I've I've written uh, once for the BFD, which was yep. um, a real pleasure for me, uh, and for Liberty Itch in Australia, commenting on New Zealand affairs for an Australian audience. That's the thing, isn't it? We're 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 not well served by the legacy media in dealing with a lot of these issues, but particularly around the, the Let Women Speak issues. Uh, what was going on there with uh, with Posey Parker it was, you know, a travesty, uh, basically a bunch of men assaulting women and thinking that they're all okay with that. Yeah, and, and that was really the thing, and, and it's what brought me to prominence, but also as a, as a, a sort of a broad social trend, it was fascinating because it, it woke people up. Like they were, they were seeing um, the the legacy uh, vestigial media concocting a completely fabricated narrative around those events about how it was all peace and love and and rainbows and unicorns, and contrasting that with the footage that that me and other independents were were um producing and publishing that showed the truth of what happened there and i think that 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 turned a lot of people off a lot more people off to to the vestigial media um which is which is great because the truth the truth tends to come out. Uh, independent and factual news organisations such as RCR, such as the BFD, um, gain audience, or at least I'd, I'd like to think so. Yeah, I mean, you, you've garnered quite a large following on X now, just poking a camera in people's faces and asking them questions, it kind of what journalists used to do. Uh, they, but, they don't seem to do that anymore. But, but you haven't got any sort of fancy gear, have you? No, not really. Uh, I I just really make do with um with bits and pieces. I think that the the only really specialist piece of equipment I have is um, an expensive Insta three hundred and sixty camera, but mm. uh, which which films that that interesting three hundred and sixty degree footage, which has proved so useful, particularly in large crowds. Um, but you know that's that's not particularly an expensive piece of equipment. It's about twelve hundred dollars. Other than that, I'm very much reliant upon using free software. Uh, for my other recording devices, I just use cell phones and things like that because that, at the end of the day, it's the content that matters and most people are consuming it in places like uh, on, on social media. Mm. So the fact that most of it is 1080p resolution or, you know, I can go up to sort of 4 and 6K, but to to be honest, Cam, most people um, uh, just watch the 1080. Yeah. You've had a little interesting uh interaction too on Ponsonby Road uh, recently where you managed to catch Jerry Brownlee, the Speaker of the House, with Golrez Garriman uh, having a, a coffee out in public after Golrez Garriman resigned in in shame, really, with their shoplifting sprees and the, and the pending charges 
that we're waiting to hear what the sentencing is on. But uh, catching them in the wild, that's a bit of a get. It, it really was. Uh, and, and as you're aware, I, I got some pushback on that and mm. uh, for releasing the video clip of the two of them in, in, in conversation. And on reflection, I think probably I should have just released a still rather than, you know, the short clip of them. But the advantage of the clip was you sort of got to see a little bit of their reaction to the fact that they were being filmed. Mm. But some people made the made the comment that they thought that it was um that it was overly intrusive and to just really sort of assuage those sorts of concerns i think i could have just produced the still which would have served my purpose to say look you know evidentially ev- evident as evidence uh this meeting very much did occur here's the photographic proof and to ask the real question which is which is why is uh someone as prominent as jerry brownlee interacting so publicly with someone who's had such a significant fall from grace uh, while proceedings in her matters are uh, in front of Unresolved. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that's the thing. That's the the question that I had. I don't think it's neither there or here or there whether you produced a still of it or a video. I don't, I don't think that matters, right? It, 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 you captured something that was unusual where an ex-MP was – being visited in Auckland by the Speaker of the House, who normally resides in Wellington or is home in Christchurch. So no real reason to be in Auckland uh, and to then catch up. Now, there may be an innocent explanation. I can think of about four or five innocent explanations for that, but it but it begs the question, what was happening? What was going on? She had resigned as being an MP. She had left the House was no longer an MP, had been before the courts, was still awaiting sentencing. Why is the Speaker of the House meeting an ex-MP? It can't be to do with parliamentary business. No, one would think not. And and there, there, there are two aspects of that that, that really struck me. The, the first was the location. It, it actually wasn't Ponsonby Road. It was uh, Federal Street by Sky City. Oh, right. Okay. Even more public. Which is very public. And also, in terms of that location, it is half a block away from the district court where her matters are being considered. Mm. Uh, Ms. Garriman and Mr. Brownlee were outside of that cafe for at least two hours. Uh, So it was very, very public. So the second aspect that occurs to me is that they were entirely unconcerned by the perception that the public would have of them meeting so very, very publicly, which may lend itself to being... um, Either one of two things occur to me. Either it's just innocent and it's innocence or it's arrogance, just simply not being at all concerned about what the public perception might be of that meeting. They haven't thought through the optics of it. But, but you know, I don't understand the criticism because if Jerry Brownlee's involved in something, well, that's a matter of public interest as of right because he is in a senior position uh, being the Speaker of the House. And Golris Garriman is very much uh, a a public person, she might want privacy, uh, she might not want to be filmed. But if that's the case, you wouldn't sit outside a, a cafe for two hours in public. If that was the case, you'd be inside and doing it privately, wouldn't you, if you wanted privacy? Yes, it's not well, up to you as someone walking past to decide, oh, I wonder if they want privacy. They'll both, both One's a former MP, the other's a current MP and the Speaker of the House. Uh, that meets the public interest uh, you know, measurement or, or, or hurdle that people want to get over. What is going on here? It's a valid question. I mean, it's, it could be innocent. But when you shut down and go into silence, give filthy looks to the cameraman like Jerry Brownlee gave you the, gave you the shade, you know, you can see <clears> it in the video, they clearly didn't like being filmed. So then, then you have to ask, well, why? Yes, and, and those are the interesting questions. The why, why, why were you meeting there? Why were you seeing this? That's what a journalist should be doing. But Absolutely that's the, right. Yeah, but we, what we've seen is the mainstream media, the legacy media, they have a cozy relationship with those in power, where they rely on them, and so they don't tend to get in, get up in the in their grill so much because well, we might get some access refused. Whereas people like you or I, we don't care about that. We yeah, just that, care that's about the story. That's yeah. that's precisely it. And uh, a lot of the criticism that uh, that came my way was from um, those sorts of people, the kind of the 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 media establishment 
uh, types who do have those sorts of relationships to maintain with politicians. But I, I thoroughly concur with you, Cam, and a point that you, you made about a journalist asking those sorts of questions uh, is, is precisely correct. And um, this video footage did, uh, it, 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 there were a lot of impressions of it on social media. A lot of people have seen it. Uh, and it has at least drawn the attention, one would think, of the movers and shakers within the parliamentary precinct. But to my knowledge, not only has parliamentary services or, or Mr. Brownlee not addressed this matter at all, no journalist has asked those questions. And I, I'm not really sure how best to proceed here. I think one of the constraints is that parliamentary services itself is not subject to OIA. So mm. when it comes to the Speaker's office, actually getting any sort of transparency from what is a fairly opaque office can be rather difficult. At least I don't know how best to proceed to to try and obtain that sort of information. Well, you probably actually can't obtain it. You're right. I mean, uh, that's the thing with the Official Information Act. There's a lot of misnomers out there about the powers that are available under the Official Information Act but it only applies to official information. And conveniently, the uh, members of parliament, when they pass that law or have amended that law, have exempted and continue to exempt parliamentary services from that. Now, there's some, there's some valid reasons for that. Uh, MPs dealing with highly personal stuff all the time, uh, immigration issues or uh, medical issues or things like that, and having that, that sort of information uh, released to the public via the Official Information Act could be harmful. But then again, the Official Information Act has Section 9 in it, um, particularly Section 9, Subsection 2, Part A, uh, which is for the protection of privacy of, of people that aren't subject to the Official Information Act, private citizens, etc. And routinely that stuff is redacted from any sort of Official Information Act request. But you're right, it is hard. But I guess we just have to keep doing what we do. You know, that's why we ask the hard questions. That's why we get everybody on from both sides of the discussion to to find out what the situation is. And I guess you're doing the same thing. You've found a niche out there. You, you've got a following on um, on X and uh, people want to see the, the video content that you're providing. Yes, it's, it's, it is rather unusual when I, when I you know, I've, I've followed your career uh, for, for many years, I think now decades uh, yeah. And watching the evolution of people such as yourself and David Farah and reading all of the interesting content that you've produced over the years and evolve and evolve into being um, proper, honest media has been wonderful to see. And I'm I'm glad to be participating in that on, on a much, much smaller scale simply by offering the occasional comment and being out and about and, and producing uh, bits and pieces of, pieces of footage. That's the thing, isn't it? It's about content that people want to see or read or listen to or whatever, and there's an audience. And, and you know, I guess RCR has proved it. You know, we had the, the legacy media writing us off while we were fundraising, but, you know, we've got we've hit our targets. We're back on air. And uh, they don't have an audience that uh, is loyal like like our audience. They don't have a community of interest that they've built and fostered uh, around their listeners. They treat uh, they treat their audience um, as somebody to be milked via either via advertising or or some other method. Uh, whereas people like yourself and and me and David Farah, people we have to deliver what our audience likes. Otherwise, they stop reading. And they go away. And that's what the legacy media is facing right now. Their audiences are departing and they're saying it's their fault. <laughs> you know? Yes, it's, it's astonishing. And I, I wrote that in my most recent article for Liberty Itch about the fact that they are actually declaring war on their own audiences. And uh, another point that you made that I'd like to address is that you're absolutely right. Like when I encounter people who follow RCR, the dedication of your audience is is really something. I mean, they really do value the work that you do, and they're very, very loyal to you. And the loyalty is is hard to engender, but extremely uh, easy to lose. And when organisations, as the legacy media has done, compromise their integrity, uh, ha as they have so publicly done, their audience flees in droves and they're looking for accurate information and it's where they, they come to other sources such as yourselves. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Integrity and trust walks in to an organization, but it leaves on a horse, is the is the old saying. Uh, that's how quickly you can destroy your organization by refusing to act with integrity or trustworthiness. And when we've seen the trust, uh, the, the trust reports that have come out that people just don't trust the legacy media anymore. They, th- they see everything as opinion, disguised opinion as news, uh, that, so they didn't, don't trust the news, so they stop watching or listening. And then the revenues drop even further, but the mainstream media don't stop to take a moment to look into the mirror and think, well, maybe we're the problem. But instead, they point the finger at their audience and say, well, it's your fault you don't trust us anymore because you're on social media. It's, so what? It- Yes, it's it is just astonishing, and 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 the world has changed. And what I think is is really fascinating is still how much public funding is provided to these organisations to produce what is truly, almost invariably, left wing propaganda that people just don't want to watch because they can see it's not true. And while we have organisations like New Zealand on air and the Public Interest Journalism Fund, all at Radio New Zealand, Television New Zealand. These are costing tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of taxpayer dollars to finance content, which is firstly untrue. And secondly, people don't want to don't want to uh, consume. And in the meantime, as the world changes and new media uh, becomes much more prominent, there is no support uh, provided to to more independent operators. No, that's right. Yeah, I looked at uh, the the Public Interest Journalism Fund, when it came out, looked at the requirements, uh, the rules, the uh, terms of engagement, and I looked at that and I thought, I can't in all conscience take any money from that because I'm not prepared to follow their rules and regulations. I just simply don't subscribe to their heroic view that the treaty is this partnership where Maori are on an equal footing with Queen Victoria when they signed the treaty. That's just not the case. Uh, you know, this was the at the peak of the British Empire. You know, uh, uh, it would carry on for uh, you know a good number of years towards uh, 1900. But in 1840, you know, Queen Victoria was in in command of you know almost half the world as as the uh, the head of the British Empire. Uh, she was, you know, subsequently a few years later appointed as the the Empress of India. It's farcical to believe that Maori somehow were on an equal footing. That some, uh, you know, guy from an iwi, uh, you know, down country in the middle of nowhere was on an equal footing and signing a treaty on an equal footing with with the uh, with with Queen Victoria. It's just farcical to even believe that. And if you read the articles of the treaty, it clearly says you're sub- sub- becoming subjects of. The British Empire. Well, that's not an equal footing. So no. it's it's insane. So we, I couldn't subscribe to that for the Public Interest Journalism Fund, and, and you know Winston Peters described it as a bribe, and he, he was dead right. And the howls of outrage from the media when he said it kind of proved his point. I think it did, and that reaction. There's a chap. I, I don't watch uh, too much mainstream me- media, but there's a a blonde chap by the name of Matty, someone, and he was with this really awful Kiwi accent, sort of saying it's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie, and it's not a lie. Uh, the, the Public Interest Journalism Fund, um, like much of the history curriculum that's been dictated by the the previous Labour regime, uh, is extremely revisionist in its approach to history. And then you have the the overarching issue that we have the state in the form of 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 the PIJF insisting upon the editorial line that anyone who takes that money and presents information to the public must adopt. And that is, you know, the the, the in the Soviet Union, Pravda, uh, Pravda, prominent newspaper, Pravda is actually Russian for truth. But yeah. even the the Soviet state didn't ever have those sorts of restrictions. No, they just shot you though. If you <laughs> well, there was that. There was that. Yes, but no. But the the the, the thing there the thing there was as in the Soviet Union was you didn't need those sorts of rules because people knew that if they didn't comply, there would be consequences. Yeah, gulags and, and all of those. All of that. Of and yeah. the, it's not. There is an analogy here, right? Like it's not just that the PIJF had those sorts of lines in the sound strict lines in the sound strict edicts it also had a cooling effect on discourse within mm. 
the mainstream media because people knew if they stepped out of line and said something that the Ardern regime didn't like, their organization was much less likely to, re to receive any sort of public funding. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's why trust has disappeared. That's why we don't we don't watch them anymore. And you know the, the same very same people that are complaining about this lack of trust, the, the media themselves, are busily slagging off people like Elon Musk, for example, who's done more for free speech than almost any other person in the world right now. And he's busily turning X, uh, you know, formerly known as Twitter, but everyone calls it X now. Uh, he's turning X into a multimedia empire. And the mainstream media haven't yet cottoned onto that. I mean, just last week, he was uh, you know, pretty much announcing that he's going to bring out XTV, which will, will come uh, as part of the app which will allow you to cast that onto a TV screen and to watch videos so people like yourself can build your audiences and have a global reach. Uh, you might be in New Zealand, but you know there might be a global reach for a particular protest or something you specialise in, seem to specialise in protests. Um, you could easily garner far more eyeballs to your videos than the mainstream media have to theirs. And the same goes for linear television. You know, I can envisage uh, RCR if we wanted to, say, produce a fifteen-minute news uh, a news broadcast that just gives you some bullet points and some things in the news, and broadcast it on X. And linear TV's dead all of a sudden. No one wants to watch the news anymore because it's at worst it's going to be three hours old. At best, it well at best it's going to be three hours old. At worst, it's four or five days late. <laughs> That's very true, and I very much hope that RCR does that. Uh, and because I do that, like the live streams that I currently produce to to X, uh, what the the way I approach things is, I'm filming, I'm recording, but I'm also often uh, live streaming things, and um, I, I subsequently clip to take out the the, mm. the boring parts. But um, they do garner an awful lot of interest. Uh, to the point where, you know, there was, I, I don't know if you called it, but about six weeks ago, I conducted um, a really poor interview with the victim of an assault on the steps of Auckland District Court. And that went viral. Hundreds of thousands of people around the world watched it. It was being shared by prominent celebrities and other sorts of prominent people around the world. And it just, you know, there was an audience for that sort of content from little old New Zealand, which I produced for free and cost people nothing to consume. Conversely, we have these state run or state funded organizations that are costing an awful lot of money and producing, as you say, content that no one, no one wants to see. So look, I, I can't encourage Asia enough to be doing that sort of broadcast, I think that um, that you know the work you guys do is great, and adding in that video capability would would be certainly something I would like to watch. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we've got we've got some plans with which we published sort of some of the information on the roadmap on, on what we want to do now that we're back on air. Um, you know, little steps first, we'll get the shows back running again, uh, then we'll move to being able to take talk back. That'll be a game changer for some other uh, players out there that'll be a bit, a bit miffed by that, who were mocking us when we went into a hiatus. But we're back and we're going to keep on doing what we do and we're now going to add different dimensions to that with TalkBack. And, yeah, I, I hope that we do add some, uh, you know, we've got a studio. We could easily stream news bulletins to X um, and have them available you know, as we go through the day. Well, more power to you, and I, I really hope so. And, and I'm evolving along those lines as well. Certainly, I'm nowhere near that sort of a scale, but um, being able to produce content that's a little bit more polished than than what I have been doing. When you sort of think that 12 months ago, I was just pumping raw footage out. Now I do things like, you know, I, I include title credits, and I'm a little bit better at, at um, editing and cutting the shots and that sort of stuff. So for me, it's that sort of evolution, but of course, on a, on a, on a much smaller scale. So yeah, um, certainly, I think... There's there's a massive market out there. Well, a, a massive, I should say, demand uh, because people like your content and what you do is great, and they want to see more of it. Yeah, and the same goes for you. There's there's an audience that can be built very quickly that would that you can't do with linear television or uh, traditional radio stations or or that sort of thing. I can see a day coming when other media are going to have to do. A fundraiser for them to keep themselves alive, 
Um, and I just don't think they're going to uh, garner the same support that we have. You know, our audience is fantastic. It's great. And they've chipped in. We've got backers that have that have come to the party. And um, they believe in the mission that we have for the New Zealand media landscape that is, I think, giving a few kittens to some of the legacy media. And we're already seeing changes in some of their programming and some of their, uh, the ways that they do things. You know, I, I see it all the time because I'm consuming this news all of the time. I mean, I, I have to watch the mainstream somehow. Uh, it might not be, uh, you know, at six o'clock sitting down watching the news. I don't do that, but I can watch their, str- their streams or I can watch their replays and those sorts of things. And I can see that they're reacting to what we're doing. Uh, and I can see that we have actually moved the dial a bit and forced them to meet the market. But I don't think they're capable of meeting the market like we have. And, and mostly I think their audience would laugh at them if they said they needed some money. <laughs> whereas, our audi- whereas our audience uh, rose to the challenge. Well, they absolutely did. And I'm sure you're right. Like the legacy media, yes, you can certainly see that they realize that they need to evolve. But I agree with you that they're incapable of doing it because the number one change they need to make is that they need to be honest and balanced. And they just cannot do that. There's just in this country, the legacy media has such a left wing bias that is not at all reflective of the zeitgeist of the times or the consensus of the populace. They just simply won't move away from it. You're never going to get these 20 something journalist graduates producing anything other than the sort of content that people want to read while over a, a cappuccino in a Greyland cafe. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. You take the New Zealand Herald, right? There's one journalist there who, you know, I I have an ongoing battle with, utterly dishonest, uh, but you know, butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. Uh, but he's been running a series of stories about about a person, a business person, who um, the police were pursuing under the Proceeds of Crimes Act, running articles about how poor and hard done by this Kiwi battler guy was and running a business. And then finally, after months and months of stories written by this journalist, we finally get the other side of the story and we find out, well, actually, this guy that he's been saying is hard done by and the police have been doing things, you know, that's untoward and perhaps they shouldn't be doing that and everyone should feel sorry for the guy. We now find out that, it, that this guy's got a history of health and safety regulation breaches, uh, ignoring notices poor safety records, which ultimately led to the death of a, a tragic death of, of one of the workers. But we finally, after months of soft soaping this guy, the journalist has finally come out and given a victim's perspective to it, which makes you think, well, why did you write all that other stuff? You've had access to the court file. You've known the evidence that's being presented by the police uh, and Crown Law in the case, and you bring it up now? It's only because I'm interested in what that journalist is saying and doing all the time that I can put all the pieces together. And most people may not have read all of those previous articles, but I implore them they should, if they if they saw it and they saw the, the victim statement, go back and look at that same journalist and look at the articles he wrote that was in support of uh, basically pushing the agenda of that business owner. And now all of a sudden it's flipped around. And that question that pops into my mind is, why? Why has that journalist done that now? Is the Herald distancing itself from the previous articles which were very supportive of that businessman because they they detect that perhaps the hammer is going to drop and he is going to be divested of his assets and those sorts of things? I'm just sitting there going, why? This is curious. It's very curious. But I see that all the time where you see, take the Green Party, for instance, they're imploding but we've got this strange situation where in the polls, the Greens seem to be going up, despite all of these poorly behaved MPs that have a high and mighty attitude towards the proletariat, you know, to use to coin the, ta- the, the terms that they're familiar with being Marxists. And the media are all on board with that. There's a disconnect, you know. The, the MPs look like ratbags to a, a seasoned political observer. There seems to be a systemic problem within that party that if it was, say, the National Party, the media would be all over it like a rash. Uh, But it's the Green Party. We're not seeing it too much. There's only one or two journalists that are doing it. And again, I ask the question, why is that? 
Yes, and it's it is rather astonishing that it's just article after article that are hagiographies of particularly Chloe Swarbrick. Now she's you know she's the leader of a minor party, and she is interesting for being a, a young person. Um, but she is also uh, an extremist. The, mm. the ideology that she promotes is, um, is 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 a danger, in my opinion, to Western civilization. And at least her ideas ought to be uh, considered and critiqued. And yet we don't see that ever in the media. There's there's nothing that she can say. And some of the things that she does say are really quite jaw droppingly extreme. And yet the media just lets lets it all slide by. And I think that there is a change, as you say, in, in the circumstance that you describe with the Herald Journalist, where latterly they reach the point where it's like, goodness, we can no longer continue to, in good conscience, hold that editorial line, simply because they're not too concerned that it's inaccurate and unfair. What they're concerned about is having egg on their faces for being mm. very wrong. Yeah, oh, I think you're absolutely right in that case. The writing's on the wall, so oh, it, there's a term for that in media. It's called a reverse ferret, and uh-huh. it comes it ca- comes from the UK. I mean, obviously, something like that's from the UK. You can't imagine an American editor ever saying that, but it's a a UK newspaper editor would be pushing an editorial line, right? Chase that, chase that, keep going on that, keep going on that, and then all of a sudden he'd burst into the newsroom, right, reverse ferret. Because his, his claim was go and put a ferret up the politician's trousers, right? Right, right. To, to, to see what the response is, and then all of a sudden they have to back away from that position, and so it was called a reverse ferret. And that's what I think we're seeing with some of the media out there, a reverse ferret on 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 some of the stories that they've been soft on maybe, pro even, and then all of a sudden the public shifts or the mood shifts or whatever, and then they have to do a reverse ferret. So maybe they're attuned to it. I, I don't think so. I think it, I think what you're saying is right. They don't want to – they're hoping that everyone forgets the articles they've written beforehand and they'll only see this one where they're putting the boot in. Yes. And then, I, and then get away with it. Yeah. I, I think you're right, and, and thank you for, for the term reverse ferret. I'm I'm going to misappropriate that from you. <laughs> I, I, I think it's wonderful. And I, th- I think I can give you a salient example of it, and that is uh, with a lot of the media coverage that we're going to be seeing in the next little while around things like um, puberty blockers and uh, the approach to the social medical transitioning of children and all of that sort of gender. The whole trans argument, full stop. I mean, you know, the CAS report in the UK is damning, and we're only just starting to see little squeaks of it in the mainstream media, whereas RCR has been covering this sort of stuff for ages. You know, I've had Rachel Stewart on talking about that. I've had Annie O'Brien on talking about that. The travesty that has occurred in silencing voices that were against the trans agenda needs to be addressed. And I think you are, you're right. We're going to see a reverse ferret from the media, but they're so embedded in that ideology that it's going to be difficult for them to do it with any credibility. Oh, it certainly is. And and uh, my, my heart goes out to the two individuals that you mentioned. You know, they they really have been uh, troopers throughout it all. There, there's been a very long It's cost time. them. It's cost them. You know, and Rachel Stewart and Annie O'Brien were talking about that when Damien Grant wrote his article and stuff saying, I should have spoken out earlier, but I went along to get along and I was silent. And and the and the women who did speak up, like Rachel Stewart, like Annie O'Brien, uh, like Posey Parker, they've been vilified. Even the author of Harry Potter books has been vilified because she stood up for women and not men pretending to be women. And that's the joke of it all, really, is that all of these people that were sticking up for the trans agenda are sticking up for blokes pretending to be women. Yes, it, <laughs> it, it, there is there is quite an irony in that. But uh, but as as a, a social contagion, it continues. I, I noticed that um, that Destiny Church had a protest in Christchurch about these issues today, and the counter uh, protest of the of the the rainbow community and their fellow travelers within the leftist communities. Uh, from the pictures that I saw, seem to be significant. And what I think people don't quite realize is just firstly how uh, embedded 
gender ideology is in New Zealand society, from schools, inside the medical profession, uh, inside the public sector and even the private sector, but also how rabid and violent some of these people can be, which which was demonstrated in Albert Park and has been demonstrated mm-hmm. many times since. And, and people who visit my YouTube channel um, will be able to see some of the examples of that behaviour. There was one in particular, which again went worldwide viral in the sense of allowing trans people to, uh, and people who uh, subscribe to that ideology, to speak for themselves. And, and I had a person do that uh, uh, outside an event where um, the Fijian agitator Shanil Lau was speaking. And mm. it was just so outrageously horrid, um, it, it, it caught a lot of attention. But the, the point I want to make is that as these people's ideology is deconstructed by the truth and the facts of things like uh, uh, the WPATH revelations and the CAS review, their reaction is likely to be extreme. And I can't recommend strongly enough that people uh, treat this, this, them, and this issue with a great deal of caution, um, because I'm, I'm very concerned that violence may, may ensue. Well, then they're kind of unhinged. We saw that behaviour with Posey Parker. Now I know someone who was there to listen to it, and uh, she was quite frightened by that whole situation. Even you were uh, in, in the press of these rabid blokes. Uh, assaulting people simply because they had a different point of view to them. That, that's true, and I've, um, I've, uh, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a trained therapist or something like that, but I, I do consider myself to be a good listener, and I've been um, since that time, which is now 14 months ago, uh, I've been dealing with with many of the women who were deeply traumatized by the things that happened to them that day, and and Cam, I can tell you there are people who are still traumatized by it, by the things that happened to them directly, whether they the abuse and the assaults and things like that, but just how let down they were by the establishment, by the police who who very much took the side of the rainbow community and looked the other way while women were being assaulted and then refused to pursue prosecutions against identified offenders, all of that sort of thing, through to a justice system that has been absolutely kid gloves when it comes to processing those very few individuals who have been held accountable. So you're exactly right and uh, that, that, that people forget that in these matters there are victims. It's the people who are assaulted for objecting. It's the Rachel Stewart's and Annie O'Brien's who, as you say, have been vilified. It's the children being harmed in schools. All of these awful things need to end and they need to be addressed. We've had politicians that have jumped on this bandwagon too, of course, notably the Green Party. You know, I kind of hold them responsible for a lot of the rhetoric, even the violent rhetoric where we had on that same day at that Posey Parker protest, Marima Davidson, who said that abuse and violence is all caused by cis, uh, cis uh, white males. Uh, you know, it's just utterly strange thing that, of course, uh, she gets that shoved back in her face almost every day on, on X when people, you know, the latest person who's committed a crime on another cis white uh, male that's committed a crime. Of course, they're not cis white males. <laughs> You know, but but that's the the sort of rhetoric, uh, in violent rhetoric, that we see from the Green Party uh, on trans issues, on LGBTQ issues, on issues regarding Israel and Hamas. Uh, you know, they they have taken the side of of Hamas. They are chanting Hamas slogans, uh, which are. It could be termed hate speech. I don't like that term. I think that's a, an awful it's speech that's offensive, uh, sure. But they don't understand that what they're actually promoting, what they're actually chanting is for the genocide of Jews in that region because that's exactly what that means. And But they, they are on the side of terrorists and violence and an ideology that has such a tiny percentage in New Zealand but takes up so much of their time. And I wonder perhaps if if the problems that the Green Party have today are because they've got these activists in a, you know, a they have a mentality or a mindset of winner takes all. 
and they will deride and attack and and vilify anybody who opposes their point of view. And we're starting to see that with Julianne Genta's um, stuff coming out. And you may be sure there'll be more incidents like that. Well, yes, I'm, I'm sure like you, uh, like me, I don't we both know people who who have interacted with her, and it, I'm sure it comes as little of a surprise to you as it does to me. Mm. But coming back to that green ideology, they're, they're not too dissim- I, I refer to them often um, somewhat facetiously as the Khmer Vert because they're, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> their ideology is very, very similar to the Khmer Rouge in, in Cambodia. Mm. Um, and that, you know, as you say, with their activists, um, it doesn't matter, and, and it's hard to distinguish between what is their caucus and what is their activist base. They're, they're pretty much one and the same. But there is no cause um, that isn't to the Green Party a vehicle to disestablish uh, democracy, liberal democracy and capitalism. It doesn't really matter to them if it's environmentalism or it's issues in the Holy Land or if it's trans rights. All of them are simply an opportunity to dismantle uh, what they consider to be oppressive capitalist uh, uh, settler society. colonialist society. Yeah, yes, keep precisely. on adding on all the insults that they that they throw at people. Um, you know, I get it all the time. Green supporters say things to me on X like, "Oh, you're a racist," and I always just reply to them, "Oh, how can that be? I'm Fijian." <laughs> They've assumed from my appearance that I'm this you know, boogie monster that's uh, privileged and white and all of these sorts of things without actually knowing where I actually come from. <laughs> you know, so yes. it's hilarious. I just like use their own terminology against them. It's like whenever I get an email from a government department that's got all sort of Namihi or this and Harimai this and all that sort of stuff in there, well, I reply to them in Fijian. And the consternation that it causes them and the apologies that you get via email, oh, terribly sorry, I didn't realise you were Fijian, blah, 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 and then everything from then on is 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 in, you know, it's in English, but with the beginning and the end of the emails now in Fijian. They've gone and got somebody to, to, to do it. And it's just, I just, I'm just playing with them, right, because I'm using their own PC rubbish that they have to show them how stupid it is, but they're so stupid that they keep on doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a I have a similar but different experience where when people do that to me, I, I respond in French, mm. and uh, they they don't bother to ever translate um, with me or make any sort of apology. What they do is that they come back in English and say, "Oh, look, we don't communicate in French." And I say, oh, "Okay, well, I don't communicate in whatever that was." It seems that we are. You know, from appearances, we have English in common. Why don't we just continue to to communicate in that? <laughs> you're you're as vexatious as I am. <laughs> but that's but that's what makes the world go round. People like you and like me, who are prepared to rattle the cages uh, of the elites, of the special and privileged people who have got there because they're an MP or think that they're special. I've just I've known so many MPs. It's not funny. I've forgotten most of their names. Uh, that's how relevant how relevant they are to me. I.e., not at all. And I was brought up. Yeah, you know, my mother taught me to treat almost everything a politician says with complete and utter contempt. Um, <laughs> she would she would tell me she'd say, "Oh, they're just saying that because that that's what they want um, everyone to believe." Um, you know, she would invite in ministers, drivers, and that to come in and have a coffee and go down the pool room and play pool and that while all of the politicians were up, upstairs, you know, talking basically rubbish to each other and patting each other on the back. I learned more playing pool with the drivers, VIP drivers, about politics than I did talking to the politicians. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. So, so, you know, that, that's how I, I learned to rattle the cages of politicians, to, to not be afraid of them. Like, you know, Julianne Genta saying something to me or you know, doing a do, do you know who I am or you really need to look at this? You know, I don't really. You know, no one's ever actually stood up to them and told them their pedigree. And that's what I've done in all of the years that I've been by writing. I've stood up to these people. It didn't matter who they were. You know, it could be John Key. I mean, I, I got John Key's chief of staff once rang me up and told me to take down an article because the boss was upset. 
And I said, well, you don't pay me. There's nothing in it for me to take it down. And, but here's the, here's the thing, right? You're just the monkey. Why don't you get the organ grinder to give me a call? And maybe I'll consider it. Well, I never heard from them. <laughs> so, so, so the post stayed up. You know, they, they threatened me. They said, oh, well, you won't get access. I'm like, that's going to stop me. <laughs> you know? So Nikki Hager did the same. Oh, well, we're, we're going to embarrass you. We're going to publish all your, all your um, communications. No one's going to talk to you. You're going to be shunned. You're going to be. I was cancelled before cancellation was uh, was even popular. You know, you were. You were. And, and I just didn't care. It didn't. It didn't phase me. I, I was asked by a journalist. Um, you know, I, I haven't. I, aren't you upset? You've embarrassed the prime minister. So, no, my embarrassment's his problem, not my problem. And when he when he's no longer the prime minister, I'll still be doing what I'm doing. And guess what? Where's John Key? Not in politics anymore. Oh, indeed. But I am, yep. <laughs> and and you are, and there's and there's more people like you coming out and thinking. Well, look, Simon Anderson can do that. I'll do that too, and there'll be well. more and more cameras everywhere recording every movement of these politicians and the and the cultural elites and the iwi elites and doing whatever they want to do. And they're going to have cameras in their faces, and that's what the mainstream media have forgotten how, what to do. I think you're right, and and I'm so. So very keen to encourage that because what I do really is as simple as just pointing a camera at something and then publishing it to X. It couldn't be easier. I, and I, I really encourage everyone to do that. The catch line that I use is that we, the people, are the media now. And yeah. we, we all are, right? Like, you know, it's it's the content that people catch live that that is the truth of matters and often gains prominence. And it's as easy as just whipping out your phone, pressing record. And if anyone out there is interested, I'm, I've, I've written how-to guides on how I approach it and um, that, that I've published on my blog. That's how Avi Yemeni got started. That's how, you know, these guys have all got started the same way. Rook Shane Fernando was a wedding photographer, yeah, wedding v- videographer. Now he's more of a journalist than, than that. That's how you get started. That's how I got started. You know, and, and, you know, just what you just said then, sort of like, flashed into my mind that, you know what, the media who, when they were originally described as the the fourth estate in the 1700s, since then they've actually become the elites that that they despised, that they used to hold to account. They've gone and created journalism courses at universities and at politics and things like that. They've created a hierarchy of themselves and where they've placed themselves and that and become part of the system that they're supposed to hold to account. You know, and and it was only in about the 18, late 1800s that we started to see media organisations and newspapers be created, which then grew into, as technology advanced, we had radios, then we had television and all those things. And everyone's going, oh, it's terrible. News Hub's finishing. You know, what are we going to do without News Hub? Well, what we did 40 years ago when we didn't have news sub is what we're going to do, right? Yes. So, so none of these things happened, or especially radio and television, none of those happened until the 20th century. And, and all before that, there weren't newspapers, there were pamphleteers, there was a guy with a little portable printing press who followed the railroad and telegraphed stories. And we're back at that, where people like you and people like, you know, Asia, yeah, we're doing this you know, on the smell of an oily rag, but producing really high high quality content that people want to listen to, that want to financially support. That's how it was in the 1800s. As the railroad spread, so spread news media, so spread um, pamphleteers, newsletter writers, all of those sorts of things that then grew into these great corporate conglomerates that are no longer fit for purpose. And so now we're seeing a readjustment to the back to the way it was. I, I I think you're right, and I hope you are, because it's an exciting time to be involved. Oh, totally, man. I'm just totally looking forward to to, to watching the demise of the legacy media. <laughs> me too, me too. Can't happen and soon. And anything I can do to push them over that line to to be like lemmings and rush off the cliff, uh, you know, that's, that's what I want to see happen, and uh, I delight in it every day. Anyway, Simon, we're pushed for time now, so um, I better let you run. Thanks so much for coming on and uh, being on the first show back after our, our little hiatus. And uh, hopefully the, the listeners will uh, get some in 
insight into what it's like to do what you do. Um, and uh, hopefully we can use some of your content on ICR as well. I'd be very pleased if you would. And, and thank you very much, Mr. Slater, for having me on. It's been a true pleasure. You're welcome. So there you go, folks. You can make a difference, even if you're just one person. Simon showed us how. Grab a phone, a microphone, and go start being a citizen journalist. The world is your oyster now, and with technology now ubiquitous and cheap, it is easier than ever to become a journalist. And let's be frank, the competition from the mainstream is not that flash. People like Simon Anderson are an inspiration even to an old war horse like me. Tell me your thoughts on what Simon Anderson had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.